Well, there's occasionally at times when you come to read the word for your family and you think, I sure am glad I'm not preaching that today. And we have one of those passages today that uh, Pastor Trent gets to preach on. And uh, it'll be in Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 to 23. Let me just say quickly that as we read passages that are confusing or challenging to us, uh, the proper heart response would be one that says, maybe challenging, maybe confusing, but we never want to stand in judgment of God's word. Amen. We never want to exceed the word of God to put judgment on a God who gave his only son to die for us, right? We can trust in that. We can trust in a God who sent his son to die for us. And so let's read then Deuteronomy 21 verses 10 through 23. When you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God gives them into your hand and you take them captive and you see among them, the captives, a beautiful woman and you desire to take her to be your wife and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails and she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured and shall remain in your house and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go in to her and be her husband and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, and if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstfruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his." If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of this city, this, our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones." So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we are a people that desire to sit under your word. Uh, We desire not to be a people that have contempt or uh, challenge it, Lord. I pray that you would condescend to have mercy on us today, that you would teach us through Pastor Trent, which you've been leading him in all week, that we might understand and, and walk away more fully aware of our own sinfulness and your great love for us and your covering of it through the person and work of your only son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I found myself just sitting here this morning and uh, weeping with joy. Uh, Not weeping over what I've got to preach to you, but weeping with joy, literally, as we saw our students and the things that they're doing in Greece. And as we see the ministry of these Stephen ministers and and, and know about some of those things going on, as we see all the people serving in our church in so many different ways, you see people bringing their friends to come and, and to hear passages of scripture read like this and knowing that there's some risk involved in doing that. There's just so, God is doing so many great things in and among you. I just am uh, 
not worthy to get to be a part of it, but I'm thankful. And I'm thankful for you. And uh, some of what I'm going to say today is pretty difficult. And, um, and I just want you to know that, that, that all of it is out of love. God's given it to us because of love. And I'm sharing it with you today because of love as well. So with that being said, um, Lee was just out doing errands for her parents a day, basically like any other day, when a group of men in uniform jumped out of a car, grabbed hold of her, salted her, drug her into the car, and drove off. And Lee didn't know, as she was carried off by these men that day, that this would be the last time that she saw her parents ever again. And she was just 14 years old. The men who took her, took her to what was called a comfort station, essentially a brothel that existed to serve Japanese soldiers during the years around World War II. And she became one of tens of thousands of what were called comfort women, women who were basically forced into prostitution, 90% of whom died before the war even ended. How does this happen? Where did this begin? Well, these comfort stations existed already, but they really got escalated in December of 1937 when the Japanese began a six-week massacre that ultimately came to be known as the Rape of Nanking. And it became known as the Rape of Nanking because over the course of these six weeks as they were destroying this city, some 20,000 to 80,000 women were sexually assaulted in that place. When the world discovered what happened, people were rightly mortified. And the Japanese emperor, recognizing that this does not look good, wanted to try to make sure that such a thing didn't happen again with his armies. And so he commanded that the comfort stations be greatly expanded so that the soldiers would have appropriate outlets to express their sexual energy in a way that wouldn't lead to a repeat of what happened at the rape of Nanking. It was an effort, we might say, to mitigate the effects of sin, and it was a poor one at that. What it ultimately led to was the kidnapping and sexual trafficking of many, many more women throughout Southeast Asia, especially China and Korea. What we discovered just a number of years ago is that these comfort stations also continued after the war with the knowledge of the U.S. and in which some American soldiers also participated. It's the kind of thing that everybody would certainly like to forget. When we read a passage like we just read here in Deuteronomy chapter 21, we find ourselves recoiling perhaps with some of what we read here. We find ourselves saying, this is terrible. This is awful. But then we hear about a situation like took place in Japanese-occupied China in the very lifetime of some of you sitting in this room. And we say, maybe actually what we discover in this passage is the wisdom and mercy of God in trying to limit the misery and the effects of sin in this world. And these four vignettes, that's precisely what we see. We see the reality of the fact that we live in a world marked by the fall and under the curse of sin. Each one of these situations are sad and terrible. Each one of these situations reveal a world that is not the way it's supposed to be. God did not create his people. He did not make us to live in a world where there is war and where there are people being taken captive and where they're getting engaged in marriages they don't want to be a part of. He didn't create a world where people are getting divorced and where families are falling apart. He didn't create a world where people would be taking multiple wives, where parents would be showing favoritism to various children. He didn't intend for us to live in a world where children would rebel against their parents and parents would neglect their responsibilities to their children. He didn't create a world where criminals would have to be executed and you'd have to figure out how do we properly deal with their dead bodies. That's not the world God meant for us to live in. 
It, it is the world we live in. And so God, recognizing the hardness of human hearts and the reality of our sinful condition in his grace and mercy, gives laws like these to minimize the effects of sin and its misery that we fully deserve because of our rebellion against him. And yet in love, he seeks to mitigate those negative effects. That's love. These laws are not giving us a picture of the way that life is meant to be, but rather serve to illustrate God's mercy in limiting the negative impacts of the hardness of human hearts. The world we live in is not the way it's supposed to be, but it's actually far better than what we deserve. And that is because of not anything good in us, but because of the goodness and mercy of God. And so I hope that this little strange corner of Deuteronomy will help us see that better maybe than we've seen before. Now let me orient you again just to Deuteronomy for those of you just joining us. This whole book is essentially a series of sermons that Moses is preaching to the people of Israel whom God has rescued out of slavery in Egypt and then he's sustained them through 40 years in the wilderness and now they are right on the border in the land of Jordan, about to cross the river and enter into a land that he had promised to give them hundreds of years before. He has purchased them. He's made them his own. He is what we call their suzerain king. And as such, they have certain responsibilities they owe to him in exchange for what he is doing and providing for them. And what we are walking through are what God calls them to do in response to what he has already done for them them. And over the last several weeks, we've been walking through implications of the various Ten Commandments. We've looked at some implications of the Fourth Commandment about Sabbath rest, and the Fifth Commandment about honoring parents and authorities, and the Sixth Commandment about not killing unlawfully. And then we come to this section, and we encounter a bunch of laws that don't actually fit neatly in any particular category. But they do all relate to various ones of the Ten Commandments, and so we can see connections there. But ultimately, what they're pointing us to is, is the, the ultimate fulfillment of the law, which is love for God and love for neighbor, and these laws point us in that direction. And in the midst of some of the craziness of what we're going to get into, through the midst of the despair and the ter terribleness of these situations, we see this ray of hope. That, that one day we may live again in a world where the curse of sin is gone and where laws mitigating the effects of sin are no longer necessary because sin is no more. And it should create in us a sense of hope and longing and desire. That's what this passage is going to do. So let's talk about these four laws that are given to mitigate the effects of sin. The first law is mitigating the effect of power imbalance. Mitigating the effect of power imbalance. The reality is, in the world, there are imbalances of power everywhere. And that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing, except for the fact that people are sinful. And so when you have sinful people with imbalance of power, it never fails that ultimately those who have power use their power to ultimately exploit and take advantage of people who don't have power. That's the ordinary course of things in a world in rebellion against God. That's not coming from some uh, philosophy, some political philosophy, or saying this is biblical. It's what it tells us about the reality of human hearts. There are power imbalances, and as long as there are sinful people in the world, power imbalances will be used to take advantage of people who don't have power. And so this law aims to mitigate that reality. And one of the greatest power imbalances are in a situation where an army has just defeated a city and taken over, and those people are completely at the mercy of the conquerors. And when that situation happens, the people who suffer the most tend to be the most powerless, namely women and children. And so in this passage, God gives a, a specific particular law to limit the effects of this power imbalance. And so we read in verses 10 to 14. When you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God gives them into your hand and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her into your house. She shall shave her head and pare her nails, 
And she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured and shall remain in your house and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go into her and be her husband and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants, but you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave since you have humiliated her. So the situation is an army has conquered a city, and this is obviously talking about a city outside the land of Canaan, because inside the land of Canaan, all the people are to be devoted to destruction, and we dealt with that in prior weeks. This is a city outside the land of Canaan where not everybody is devoted to destruction, and it may be that a young soldier discovers there's one of these four ladies that strikes his fancy, and he decides he wants to have her. This has been a common situation throughout history. The common situation throughout history, though, in the ancient Mediterranean world and actually through most of the world, through most of history, is that when an army conquers a people, the women are ultimately at the sexual whims of the conquerors. There are no rights. There are no protections. The winners do whatever they want. Well, God says, not so with my people. It will not be this way. When you go in and you conquer a city, if you have an interest in one of these women, here's how it's going to be. Your interest in her is not as a sexual object. Your interest must be in her as a wife. That's huge. It, it still strikes us as strange and unpleasant, perhaps, but this is unheard of. And not only that, not only must you think of her as a wife, but... You're to bring her to your home, and you're to give her 30 days, the typical period of mourning, you're to give her 30 days to mourn the loss of her mother and father and her life as she knew it. And you allow her to go through a process of, of transformation, in a sense. The shaving of her head, the clipping of her nails, the taking off of the old clothes is a sense of transitioning from one way of life to a new way of life, maybe part of a morning ritual. We're not entirely sure. But when you look at this law and you ask, who does this law serve to protect? Whose interest is this law given for? This law is given for the woman. It's given for the powerless. It's given to protect her from what would ordinarily happen at almost any point in history, anywhere, in a similar situation. Now, not only must you give her this month to mourn, but the Israelite soldier is supposed to also be taking that month to actually reflect on whether or not he wants to take this woman as a wife. He doesn't simply get to act on whatever his basest instincts might be. Instead, he needs a 30-day period of reflection to say, am I willing not just to have sex with this person, but am I willing to actually take her for a wife and to provide her all of the rights and obligations that are due to a wife? And if, in fact, they go ahead and enter into that relationship, then he is responsible to do exactly that. Now, the reality, again, of life in this fallen world and because of the hardness of human hearts is that sometimes marriages don't make it. And sometimes they don't make it for reasons the Bible describes as essentially biblical reasons for, for why marriage might end and sometimes for non-biblical reasons, but the reality is some marriages don't make it. And here's the extra protection that is given to this woman. When the marriage doesn't make it, you are not free to sell her into slavery. You're not free to make her your own slave. She is an image bearer of God and she shall be treated with dignity and respect. And you're to let her go free. And the reason that's given in verse 14 is since you have humiliated her. The Hebrew word here for humiliated is difficult to translate, but it shows up in a number of different places in the Old Testament. It typically shows up in contexts that have to do with violation of a sexual sort, with actual sexual assault, and with humiliation and, and bringing shame of someone. And essentially what's being said here is, you have already humiliated her by taking her in this way and essentially violating her, you are not to add further to the shame that you have already put upon her. 
This is a law that aims to protect the powerless against those who had power and to ensure in the midst of a fallen world where there is sin and all of the negative realities that this captures, the aim is to mitigate the negative effects of such a situation. Now, we read this again through our 21st century lens and we say to ourselves, man, I'm really glad to be a woman living in the world today and in the West particularly and not a woman living at this time. And that actually is a good and right instinct. Uh, It is better on many different levels. But one way that we haven't actually made much progress and maybe even worse than in the time when this was written is with regard to respect for women's sexuality. Biblically speaking, for a man to have sex with a woman is to engage himself to provide for her all the rights of a wife. That's what it means. If you're going to, if you're a man and you're going to engage in a sexual relationship with a woman, what you're doing, biblically speaking, is you're committing to provide for her all of the the rights that are due to a wife. And when we permit ourselves to get involved in a sexual relationship with somebody outside the biblical order, which is commitment and covenant and then the consummation, and when we allow ourselves to get out of that order and we consummate the relationship and maybe there's a commitment and there's probably never gonna be a covenant made, what we're doing is we're, we're essentially agreeing to be concubines, except, not our, we're, except it's actually worse than that because concubines actually had some rights and protections. And we're actually willing to give ourselves away sexually for far less than what even a concubine might have. And we think it's normal. And I want you to see... Uh, in the context of even a war situation, God says that's not any way to be involved in sexual relationships. Along these lines, there are many um, in the church and in churches who are living together with people as though they are married and they're not, living in sexual relationship together with each other as though they're married and they're not. And it's increasingly normal. And there are people, those of you sitting in here, who are thinking to yourself, yeah, I'm not right now, but I don't really see what the big deal is. I could see myself entering into a relationship with somebody in this kind of a way. And because it's totally normal, culturally acceptable. And what I want you to to realize is it's not normal and it's not biblical to enter into that kind of relationship where there hasn't first been a covenant commitment that says, no matter what I find out about you going forward, I will not leave you or forsake you till death do us part. And and, and the biblical wisdom is do do not give that most intimate part of yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, to a person who has not first said to you, I will not leave you. You can share all of yourself with me and I will be committed to you to the end. If you're in a relationship with a man or a woman who is suggesting to you that you should move in together and live like you're married without giving you the covenant commitment till death do us part, let me reinterpret for you what they've said. What they're saying to you is, and they may not even understand that this is what they're saying because it's so culturally acceptable, but this is what they're saying. I like you, and I enjoy having sex with you, and I would love for us to have the opportunity to do that more frequently by living together. And from what I know about you, you're pretty great. However, I reserve the right to drop you like it's hot. If I should discover something about you I don't like. And I reserve the right 
to say, right now, you're the best I can do, but I'm not willing to lock myself into you because I still believe there might be somebody out there better than you who's willing to take me, and if they will, I'm gonna drop you. So I'm committed to you, totally, until somebody better comes along. And until it suits my own best interests, I will not hurt you until it suits my own best interests to do so, in which case all bets are off. Are we good? <laughs> Can we do this? You should be insulted that someone would treat you that lightly. And we hear this, but rent is so expensive. <laughs> I know. But what are you worth? Because the Bible says you're worth so much more than saving some months of rent. So much more. And sometimes people will say to you, it's just a piece of paper. It's not just a piece of paper, else you would sign it. Right? It's just a piece of paper, then sign it. You know it's not just a piece of paper. It's a covenant commitment before God and people that God intends for people to make so that they can enjoy the fullness of what he intended sexual relationships to be. I want you to experience that goodness that God intends for you. And I don't even want it half as bad as what he wants it for you. So we see in this law, the protection of the powerless against those who have power and are, are likely to use that power to exploit and take advantage of those who don't. And we can extrapolate from that and ask ourselves, where else do we see situations where people who don't have power are liable to be manipulated and exploited by those who do have power? And you can know that God's heart is actually with those who are likely to be taken advantage of. And you, as a person who loves him and loves his heart, can join in the side of saying, I want to do what I can to protect and defend and support those people who don't have a voice and who don't have power. Because that's God's heart. And it should increasingly be our hearts, wherever we see it. The second law we see is mitigating the effect of partiality in the home. And... I'm just gonna read it for you and then we'll talk about it again. Verse 15, if a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, and if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved who is the firstborn, but he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So there are two issues we need to talk about. One of them is what this passage is really about, which is how do you deal with a situation of a birthright and who it properly belongs to. But the immediate presenting situation that strikes us as more odd is that we're talking about a situation where a man has two wives among God's people, uh, bigamy or polygamy. And what do we make of this? Well, as you read through the Old Testament, you'll discover is that there are multiple ones of God's people, even heroes of our faith, who have multiple wives. It's an, it's an uncomfortable reality for us. And what you'll also find as you read through the Bible is that that practice is not explicitly condemned. In the Old Testament, as we read through, what we discover is that God at least tolerates the reality of the fact that due to the social situation at the time that men would have more than one wife in some cases. Now, the reality is this is not nearly as common as what is sometimes supposed. It was generally only kings who Deuteronomy explicitly forbids from having multiple wives, but generally people with position, power, and wealth who would engage in these kind of relationships. And, and what... So that's, 
That's the situation. Furthermore, as we read through the Bible, we see that this is not uh, a good situation. Basically, every example we see of polygamy, and as we read through the Old Testament, is saying to us, this is a bad idea. You, you should, probably shouldn't do this. Look at the troubles and the problems that this causes. So, so there is an undermining of a polygamous situation as we read through the Old Testament. And certainly once we come into the time of the New Testament. And we can also say about this situation that just like Jesus said about divorce, he could also say about polygamy, that from the beginning, it was not so that this is tolerated because of the hardness of human hearts, but this is not God's creational intention. God's creational intention is one man and one woman in a lifelong covenant relationship together called marriage. Now, when we read about uh, polygamy, we say to ourselves, you know, we read about these passages as 21st century Westerners, and we look at them, we're like, man, these people are so messed up. 3,500 years ago, or they're just so messed up and crazy. I'm glad we don't live in a time where people do crazy stuff like this. Well, you know, people do still do this uh, in multiple parts of the world. It's illegal in our own country, and that's a good thing. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be legal as it does create all sorts of problems. But, you know, we actually have normalized something else that from a biblical perspective is, is actually more abnormal than polygamy. And I'm talking about divorce. We because of the ubiquity of divorce, think of it as being somewhat normal. And it is normal, right? 50% or so marriages. And I'm not here to harp on divorce. I'm just saying we see it as normal. It's, it's basically a normal way that marriages come to an end right now. But biblically speaking, that's actually farther from creational intention than even what polygamy is. One Old Testament scholar and ethicist writes this. He says, Whereas polygamy is a kind of expansion of marriage beyond the monogamous limit intended by God, divorce is a severing destruction of marriage. Polygamy multiplies relationships where God intended a single relationship, but divorce destroys that relationship altogether. In other words... From a biblical perspective, divorce is actually further outside the biblical norm than polygamy would be. I'm not, make, I'm not trying to make a case for polygamy. Don't hear, what I'm, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm just saying we have to recognize and appreciate when we say in a judgment on people living at other points in history that things that we think are normal, we're actually farther off from where they are. If you polled Americans and said, which is worse, polygamy or divorce, 99% would say polygamy. Biblically speaking, we're actually farther off the mark. So that's something to consider as we talk about this. Now, the situation is you have a person here who's in a polygamous marriage. They've got multiple children. And, and as is going to be the case in a polygamous marriage, one wife is going to have more favor than the other. And what the Hebrew says is one of them is loved and one of them is hated. It doesn't exactly mean hated like the same way we talk about the word hated. But we see this as we read through the New Testament this same phrase, this, this Hebrew concept of loving the one and hating the other comes up in multiple places. Like when Jesus says, unless you hate father and mother, you can't be my disciple. He's not saying hate in the way that we think of hate, but he's talking about a love and a devotion and an allegiance for one that is so much greater and so much more obvious that it's like com comparable to hatred by comparison. And so in this bigamous marriage, Man has a wife that he loves and another one who is obvious to everyone he doesn't love as much. Yet, the unloved wife is the one who has the firstborn child. In this cultural context, the firstborn child gets the birthright. But because he doesn't like the wife, at least not compared to the other one, he may be tempted to take the birthright that belongs to the firstborn and give it to the son of the wife that he does love. Another situation where there is a power and the opportunity to abuse that power for one's own ends. And what does God do? God inserts a law here to protect one who has no other means of protection. And what he says is, you don't get to do that. The right of the firstborn goes to the firstborn, whether he's the son of the wife you don't love as much or not. Why did that matter? It mattered, as we see, because the firstborn gets a double inheritance, a double portion of the inheritance. 
And the reason for that double portion of the inheritance is that the firstborn would be the one who's expected to take care of the parents as they continue to age. And then once the parents pass, would be responsible for taking care of the rest of the family. So they're given a double portion for the extra responsibilities that comes with this. But to take the right of the firstborn and give it to another not only deprives them of the inheritance that's rightfully theirs, but it actually puts them in a, it's a dishonorable position. They've been shamed, essentially. And so God here gives this law to protect the firstborn from that kind of shame. Now, we're crossing so many cultural years and barriers and different things. You know, the reality is we don't do the right of the firstborn anymore. Um, there may be cultural reasons to do so. There's nothing unbiblical about a, taking this approach to dealing with one's inheritance, if you want to set it up that way. But there's nothing biblical that requires us to set it up that way either. And most people don't take that kind of an approach to an inheritance. But I think the thing that we can learn from this is that, uh, that God cares that we treat the children entrusted to our care in ways that are right and honorable and just and fair. And that whether the children in our home are our biological children, our adopted children, stepchildren, foster children, whatever sort of children God has entrusted to us, that we would treat them with the love and the respect that children need in order to flourish in a home and that we wouldn't bring shame and dishonor upon them in the ways that we are caring for them. So I think that's the heart of God here in this situation, looking out for the best interests of the children in the family, and in particular, in this case, the firstborn. But the reality is, no parents admit this that I'm aware of, they shouldn't, that they have favorites. And the, what the Bible says is, in order to mitigate the negative effects of our human hearts, is that we're called to treat each of them in ways that are appropriate and right. The third law we see is a law mitigating the effect of rebellious children. Verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives." And they shall say to the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. So the situation here is one in which the, the, the family has a son. We're not talking, this is not a toddler who keeps digging in the trash and you keep saying, don't dig in the trash and they keep digging in the trash. This is not the situation even of a, of a teenager who's experimenting with alcohol or drugs. This is a situation where you have a young adult who is persistently and consistently stubbornly rebellious against their parents and they will not heed instruction. This is not a situation where the parents have neglected their responsibility to their child, but the text explicitly says, though they discipline him, he will not listen. This is an incalcitrant rebel in the household. And the parents sum him up as saying, he's stubborn, he's rebellious, he doesn't obey, he's a glutton and a drunkard. And what happens is the parents essentially come to their wit's end. Say, so we've done everything the Bible says to do for this child. They're not responding. We are helpless to do anything about the situation. And here's what I believe they come to realize. This is no longer a situation that simply affects our family but this is a situation that is going to have impact on our community. And so they come to the elders of the city and they present the case. Notice they are not themselves given the right to execute this stubborn and rebellious child. They hand it over to the proper civil authorities. And those civil authorities, then they weigh the case and they likely would be familiar with the situation. And if they concur with what the parents have said, then we read verse 21, then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. And so you shall purge the evil from your midst and all Israel shall hear and fear. Pretty drastic solution, we might say. But what are we to learn from this? And what are we to take away from this? First of all, we don't have any biblical example of this law actually being put into effect. So we don't know that it ever actually happened. 
However, it probably would have given some teeth to parental efforts at discipline (laughs) for the child to know that such a law existed if they persistently and stubbornly continued to rebel against their father and mother. You see, what the fifth commandment reminds us is that children are to honor their parents. And what the New Testament reminds us about that commandment is that it comes with a promise that you may live long in the land. Now, think about this. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18, we're told, discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. In other words, the parent who neglects to discipline their child is essentially setting their son up to be the kind of one who meets an early death. Now, in our current cultural context, that's not going to happen because you hand your child over to the elders. They're not going to be stoned. They're not going to meet an early death that way. But the fact of the matter is if we fail as parents to do our parental duty of disciplining and training our children the way they should go, we very well are likely setting them up for an early departure. Now, that's a proverbial piece of wisdom. The reality is that there are children who are submissive who sometimes die early. And the reality is that there are parents like these who are faithfully disciplining their children, and yet they wind up in this kind of a situation. So we have to, we're talking about wisdom here, not necessarily promises about the way things will go. But the ordinary course of things is, is that in a household where parents are training and disciplining their children in the way they should go, that those children are going to be set up to be better off in life than in a household where they're not or where the child refuses to receive the discipline that is given. The fact of the matter is, is that the home and a stable family is the foundation for a stable society and community. And where the home and the family are undermined, devalued, broken, and falling apart, that's going to have immediate impacts not only upon the family itself, but upon the church and upon the community. And so this law aims to mitigate some of the negative effects of what can happen when family goes wrong. Patrick Miller writes that the parents are the first rank of persons whose authority must be acknowledged in order for human community to work in behalf of goodness and peace. When we're teaching our children what it means to honor their parents, we are teaching them what it means to honor every other authority in their life as well. And so when we as parents fail to teach our children what it means to honor their parents, We're not only shirking our own responsibility to our children, but we're actually doing damage to the community that we're a part of because we're going to release kids into the world who are a scourge on society as opposed to a blessing. We see plenty of examples of this happening at any point in history, including right now. There's a challenge we face as parents who are trying to teach our children what it means to honor uh, us and honor our authority and thereby to learn what it means to honor every other authority in their life, including God. And the challenge is that there's a really strong trend to want to be our kids' friends, and particularly as they get older into their teen years. And there's nothing wrong with being friendly with our kids and for wanting to have a, a kind of a good relationship except when we forsake our first responsibility, which is to be our child's authority, and to teach them what it means to be submissive to authority starting in the home. Now, the challenge is is that many parents are in a situation where they don't have as much time with their kids as they would like, perhaps because of work, perhaps because of a shared custody situation. This This is a challenge. And the result is that no parent wants to spend what little time they have with their kids, making their kid hate them because they are exercising authority. And so they want to be going along and so on. But it is the parent's job to execute, to demonstrate authority, and to do so in such a way that the child learns, both from being small to when they leave the home, that mom and dad are to be honored and respected, and not just them, but so also are teachers, and so also are my coaches, and so also are the police, and so also are the leaders of my government. 
And it's parents' job to teach that. There was a study done, and uh, I read about it in a paper from the Office of Juvenile Delinquency and Prevention. And, and this is what they said. Now, this is, this is um, here's what the study says. It says, other than having a prior record, a youth's demeanor or contriteness was the most crucial factor in police decisions to arrest. A youth who is respectful is more likely to receive a warning Whereas a youth with a negative attitude or who disrespects police officers is four times more likely to be taken into custody or arrested. Now that's across the board, across races. The sad reality is, is that if you are black, you are more likely to have an encounter with the police to begin with. Statistically, that's the way it is. But amongst all of those who have an encounter, if you are disrespectful and have a negative attitude toward the police, you are four times more likely to be arrested. Where are children to learn that having a negative and disrespectful attitude toward authority carries consequences? It's not the police's job to teach them that. And it's not the teacher's job, and it's not the coach's job, and it's not the government's job. That's our job as parents. That if you have a negative and disrespectful attitude to the authority in your life, there will be consequences. And they don't get less as you get older, they get worse. And now you might be sitting out there saying to yourself, yeah, yeah, people should really tell the people in the black community that if they would just tell their kids when the police pull them over not to drive off and run away, then we won't keep having the same kind of bad outcomes that we've been having. The reality is there is truth to that and it needs to be said in the right context by the right people. But do you think that they're the only ones who have problems with authority? Let me ask you this. When the properly constituted authorities in our government or even our church asked you to wear a mask, how did you respond? (laughs) Because as far as I know, you know, we all have different opinions about whether they work or not. That's neither here nor there. but, But there's nothing unbiblical about it. We can talk about that later. I'm happy to. But there's nothing, I don't believe he's asking, anybody was asking us to sin. How did you respond when the authorities in your life asked you to do that? Did you respond with a negative and disrespectful attitude? You see, the reality is all of us have an authority problem. Even the ones of us who think we don't have an authority problem. We got an authority problem. I got an authority problem. And the reality is what all of us deserve is what this child gets. The Bible tells the story of the prodigal son. What's the the prodigal son? He's a glutton and a drunkard who takes and rebels against his father and runs off into a far country and does everything that he knows is wrong. He won't listen to anybody, makes a mess of his life. What does he just say? He's exactly the kind of person who deserves what this passage prescribes. And so are we, because our authority issues aren't primarily with people, they're with God. And what we deserve is to be stoned to death. And yet Jesus tells us that story to tell us about God's posture of mercy and love and patience with rebellious sinners like us who have authority issues. And it should give us the ability to also be patient with others as we are working through our own authority issues, while at the same time training our children what the Bible says about how we properly respond to authority. And we have a responsibility as adults, parents and grandparents, to model for our kids what honoring authority looks like, which starts with how we engage with and talk about our own parents, how we talk about and engage with at least when we get pulled over, those of you who get pulled over, (laughs) how we talk about authorities in the church and how we talk about authorities in government. We're, We're showing them what it looks like to honor authority one way or another. So we have a responsibility. Finally, the law mitigating the effect of capital crimes. You all haven't had enough yet. If a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he's put to death, you shall hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. The man is not killed by hanging. He's executed probably by stoning, and then he's later 
hung up. And the reason he's hung up is not because the Bible says you need to hang up somebody like this, but he's hung up because that was a common cultural practice as an example to people that if you break the law, this is what's going to happen to you. The idea was to instill fear in, in people, and so it is. Now, there's some question about this phrase, for a hanged man is cursed by God. What does that mean? Is he cursed because he was hung, or is he hung because he was cursed? The answer is, he is hung because he was cursed. In other words, we're talking about a situation where a person has broken God's law and thereby has gotten for himself the death penalty. He has fallen under the curse of God in its most ultimate form, which ultimately separates him from the covenant community and even from life itself. It was a shameful thing. And so God says, if you do that and you hang them up, you need to take them down before the end of the day. Why? Well, we're not told exactly. It may be out of mercy to the hanged man's family to keep from more shame being heaped upon them for his actions. But probably it's more practical than that, that if a body is left hanging up overnight, it won't be long before birds and animals come and do their thing and scatter uncleanness uh, across the land. And so God says, before the end of the day, they need to be taken down, they need to be buried because dead bodies were ritually corrupting. And so it's somewhat preventative. But here's what's striking about this passage. It is a shameful thing to be executed because of breaking God's law and furthermore then to be hung up as an example of what happens to law breakers. And so when we come to the New Testament and the Apostle Paul uses this example to describe what Jesus did, it should astound us. In Galatians chapter three, verse 10, he writes, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. It's right out of Deuteronomy. If you don't do everything Deuteronomy says, you're, you're under a curse. Now it is evident that no one is justified by God, before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. The law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. And here's the good news. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, illustrated by being hung up, by re becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What Deuteronomy says is that we've all broken God's law, therefore we are all rightly under his curse, and we see the evidence of it around us every single day. The good news of the gospel that no one could have anticipated is that Jesus Christ himself would come and live in the midst of this cursed world that is not the way that it should be. And not only that, but he would go to a cross where he would actually bear the stoning, the judgment, the, the death penalty that our crimes and rebellion against God deserve. And not only that, but that he would be hung up and publicly shamed and humiliated with the shame and the humiliation that our own sins deserve. And in so doing, bear the very curse of God for our law breaking, so that we who only deserved curse might instead receive the promised blessing of the Holy Spirit and the gift of salvation. Through no doing of our own, but simply through trusting in the one who became the curse that we deserved to be. In his offer to all of us, all of us who not only live in this sin-cursed world but contribute to the ugliness of it, is that if you will put your trust in what he did for you on the cross, you will no longer be under the curse. And instead of getting what you deserve, you will receive what Jesus deserved, which is the blessing of God, the promise of his presence, the hope of a new world where all of the effects of sin and all the reasons why these laws had to exist no longer exist anymore because he's making all things new and you can be a part of it. And when you have that hope and that knowledge and that confidence that you're no longer condemned for all the ways you've broken God's law, then you can begin to live your life even in the midst of this broken world in a way that reflects the hopes and the values of the world that is yet to come. And this is what the world needs.
So if you don't know him, I invite you to trust him. And if you do know him, I invite you to reflect on his love and his mercy as it's shown to us, not only in these laws, but ultimately through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Let's pray to that end. Lord, we thank you that though we are sinners and though we are the reason the world is as it is, you came and you died for us to make the world as it should be. And we thank you that you extend the offer of the gospel to people like us. And I pray, Lord, for any who haven't received it, that today they would receive it and say, I want to be a part of a world that's not like this one. And Lord, that you'd do a work in their hearts, that they might give their lives to you and live their lives for you. And that together as the covenant people of God, we would be those who reflect the values you show us in your word and that reflect the value that we have as your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.